everybody. I see some of you are sitting outside, some of you are inside. Um, I was out for a little while this afternoon and the wind was kind of, it was kind of breezy and I thought, oh no, I hope it doesn't blow up a thunderstorm and crash our meeting tonight. <laughs> Doesn't look like that's gonna happen. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, I was digging in the dirt and it's still really wet. So I think we can do, go a few more days without rain. Um, so I hope you've recovered from that rain. I actually took some pictures in my landscape this afternoon of plants that are wilted and I'm afraid I've lost them. Two dogwoods that I've had in the ground for three years. Uh, oh, and even a butterfly bush. Um, so, you know, I'm concerned that those plants have, are, have bit the bullet and they're going to die on me, but we'll see what happens. Um, summertime's here. You know, heat and humidity hit us hard yesterday, and so I'm pretty sure we're, we're into summer now. Um, but uh, tonight, it's my pleasure. Uh, as far as logistics go, before I introduce Annie, our speaker, um, if you have questions as Annie goes along, please type those in the chat box. I will be monitoring that. And when Annie comes to a natural break point or when she can come to a pause, uh, I will feed those questions to her uh, so she can answer them and everybody can hear. Um, so without any ado, I want to introduce um, Annie Howe, she's a Union County Extension Master Gardener volunteer. Uh, she joined the Master Gardener program in 2009. So in the 10 plus years that she's been a volunteer, she's had various roles. She's been, I guess, vice president, president. I don't know what all kind of officer roles other than those two she <laughs> held. But um, in the most recent years, She's been our uh, sales committee leader. So she heads up three major plant sales that the Master Gardeners have every year. Now, this year's kind of been a bust as far as that goes. Our February a plant sale was a great success. We had to cancel our one in uh, April and we're afraid we're, we may have to cancel the, the fall one as well. So uh, what else do I want to say about Annie? Oh, she's our insect lover. She's one of the master gardeners that loves insects. And so she has this huge collection. I think it pretty much when she takes it out for show and tell, fills up the back of her car because she's got jars and containers and all kinds of things filled with insects. But she's also big into pollinators, the beneficial insects. So uh, you're really in for a treat tonight to hear Annie talk about pollinators and how to bring them into your garden. Uh, so, Annie, uh, without any ado, I'll turn it over to you and let you get started. Okay, thanks. Uh -huh. Welcome, everybody. Can you hear me all? Good, and I appreciate your time. Yeah. Yes. Okay, do I want to minimize the, the chat off to the left that I, that I opened up? You just, can. You can, because I okay. can still see it. Yeah. Okay. And then just open up your PowerPoint and start it. Okay. Or share your screen. You know, go down there to the green on the bottom and share your screen to share your PowerPoint. Sure. Oh, there you go. That's what I forgot. Okay. There we go. Is that better? Is everybody seeing that? Yes. Okay. All right. Why am I? Oh, here we go. Hang on. There we go. Okay. There you go. Finally, I was just reviewing it before and I stopped at the end and I'm like, why am I not at the beginning? Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me okay. Uh, typically when I speak for large groups, I'm fairly loud. So if I'm too loud for your computer, you can turn the volume down and uh, that might help a little bit. Um, but anyway, yes, I am uh, Annie Howell, actually Anne Marie, but Annie is my, the name I actually answer to, uh, unless I'm in trouble, then I answer to Anne Marie. <laughs> but uh, tonight's program is specifically designed for just pretty pollinators, and I, I picked them out for a reason. Um, you know, not that I have anything against honeybees or, you know, those pollinators, you know, the honeybee is the poster child for pollinator conservation, as is the monarch butterfly. 
But you know, the unsung heroes of, of pollination are really butterflies and mostly moths, believe it or not. So we'll go into that um, a little bit where a lot, there's a whole nother uh, world of pollination going on at night while we're all sleeping. So I kind of want to talk about that a little bit. Um, so Ed, like Debbie said, if you have any questions, just post them in the chat and she'll get to me when I get to um, a stopping point. Um, the next screen that I have up here is helpful websites. And I actually have this in the presentation more than once. Uh, there's a lot of great information in all of these different uh, organizations that they have everything from um, plantings, you know, what to plant, where to plant. A lot of them are broken down by area of the country. So you definitely want to look for something that's specific to the Piedmont of North Carolina. Because uh, some of these are national or international organizations, so you definitely want to go and be more specific to your area, and we'll cover uh, that in a little bit as well. Um, so if you want any of this information, by all means, we will post it uh, somewhere that you can access it uh, so you don't have to scribble furiously um, as we're going through this. Whoops, what did I just text? What did I do? Okay, so frequently asked questions about butterflies uh, and moths and how uh, a lot of folks are, you know, it's been pretty much the it thing to do the last few years is to plant a butterfly garden. And so as a master, an extension master gardener, we get asked that question a lot. You know, like, what do I want to do? Where do I start? Um, well, basically, you have to start by understanding who it is that you're trying to get into your garden. And, uh, and in the long run, you have to understand yourself in that you have to be prepared for the onslaught of once you plant it, they will come. And a lot of times it's not pretty. So you just have to be ready for that. And we'll talk about that as well. Um, a lot of the frequently asked questions, you know, aren't butterflies and moths the same? You know, what is a skipper? That's a whole nother uh, insect. You know, how do they pollinate my plants? Why do my plants get eaten? Sometimes you know, there's absolutely nothing. They get chewed to the ground. Uh, and then what is metamorphosis? And we'll just touch a little bit on that because uh, that could be a whole uh, successful gardener class in and of itself. Um, to explain the difference of what I call pretty pollinators, there's three broad categories, as you can see here. There's butterflies, which are the lepidotrons, the moths were the Frenetiae and the skippers, which are Hesper Hesperoidiae, which is the one on the bottom. Now to understand the two of them, you know, butterflies versus moths, you can see these are some just criteria of what makes them different. Uh, they are a, a, a very similar in that they do fly, they go from flower to flower, but it's time of day that they fly. Uh, not all moths fly during the night. Uh, some of them actually do fly during the day. Um, but these are pretty much broad um, criteria as to what makes a pollinator, a fluttering pollinator, a butterfly versus a moth. Um, but if you can see the statistics here, there's only 725 plus species that live in New York in North America, north of Mexico, and 20,000 species of butterflies worldwide, where at moths, there's 11,000. So that's almost, you know, 10 times as many uh, moths in North America, and almost, you know, uh, again, 10 times uh, that worldwide. So a lot of the pollination that's going on is actually happening at night, believe it or not, uh, just for by sheer numbers, like if you want to do it by the numbers. Now, the skippers is a very interesting little insect category um, in that they kind of are crossed between the two, like a butterfly and a moth. They tend to be smaller. They're duller in color. They have very thick bodies, similar to a moth. Um, and there's about 3,500 species worldwide total. So it's a very small category. But here in the Piedmont of North Carolina, we actually have quite a few um, of skippers that are indigenous to our area. So they're just very cool. And I have some pictures of them um, as examples. And I'm sure once you see them, you'll be, oh, I never knew that's what that was. So I'm just going to go through some pictures here, Debbie. So if, you, if anybody's got any questions up until this point, um, I can try and answer them because these are just going to be examples of some of the caterpillars you might see that match up to some of their butterflies. No questions so far. Okay. 
the Gulf fritillary is one of those very pretty ones. Uh, the white spots that you see at the butterfly, uh, that's actually its underwing, and they're actually silver. They're iridescent, so they're very, very showy butterflies. Uh, and their caterpillar is actually kind of strange looking. It's very prickly. Um, and a very, very uh, popular butterfly. The fritillary category in general uh, uses the uh, pat native passion flower that's pictured there um, in the corner, the little purple flower that were, some people know it as a may pop um, and the fruit is actually edible, et cetera, et cetera. But this is a host plant that is actually native to our area. And there's probably five or six different fritillary butterflies that use that as a host plant pretty regularly here in, in our area. This is an example of a Luna moth. You may see them. Sometimes they just hang out on the side of a, a building or a door. Um, during the day, they're just chilling. You know, they're very, very, one of the more pretty moths. Um, the polyphemus moth, this is one that I actually hatched. And by the way, I can brag all these pictures of insects that I hatched myself. Um, so this is the, a very interesting thing about this is that the eye spots on its hind wings uh, make it look like an owl's face because most butterflies, when they land, they land with their wings closed. Some moths on the flip side rest with their wings open and it's really scare tactics. It's to make them look like something that they're actually not. And a lot of times they'll mimic, you know, owls or things like that where like a predator um, so that they won't get eaten. So yeah, that was, that was hatched in 2014. Uh, it was so pretty. This was another moth that I actually ha uh, hatched. And uh, just, I say hatched, I actually have a butterfly hatchery. I have a little, it looks like a tiny rabbit hutch that I put caterpillars in there with food and we'll go through some of the host plants and things like that. So if you're interested in rearing them, um, that you can do that as well. And it's very easy. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. It's like, you know, these are all my children. I have pictures of everybody. <laughs> so <laughs> this one um, actually was incredible. The caterpillar that went to this cecropia moth was about the size of a hot dog, if you can imagine. So picture a giant green, um, prickly looking hot dog with red and blue spots on it. And when it went into its cocoon, its cocoon was about the size of a softball. And it overwintered in its cocoon for 10 months. And then it, when it hatched, this is what came out. It was absolutely glorious. This moth is probably one of the biggest moths that we have here in, in North Carolina uh, and also in North, uh, North America. They um, are in the Saturnidae family, so they're giant silk moths. And uh, the wingspan on this thing was just, it's pro it was probably about six or seven inches. It was huge. It was absolutely gorgeous. So yes, I can brag on him a little too. Um, this is a skipper and they're kind of hard to see. Uh, this is the silver uh, spotted skipper. So if you can see, they're kind of duller in color, like I mentioned earlier, uh, but they get their name for the way that they flutter. So butterflies kind of, you know, flutter around and moths are more like streamlined flying, but skippers kind of look like they're skipping through the air, which is what actually gives them their name um, of a skipper. And they, like I said, there's 3,500 of them worldwide, but I believe it was one of the wildlife classes where uh, one of the speakers talked about skippers in, in depth. Um, and it was really uh, nice to see that we actually have quite a few here in North Carolina. Um, so just between those three categories of uh, pretty pollinators, uh, they're all pollinators. They all work that way. Uh, and they basically, how they pollinate your uh, plants is that they go from flower to flower, actually looking for food, which is the nectar. Um, and then they pick up pollen on their feet and on their bodies. Um, uh -huh. Usually butterflies sitting on the kitchen table. are very um, hairy. So just like bees, they will pick up pollen on their bodies as they're moving from flower to flower. And then mix up the pollen and leave a trail behind them as they go. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison as to what a you see it? body looks like versus a um, 
the butterfly body. So it actually, the, the text on this is kind of blurry, but you can get the picture that, you know, butterflies on the right are obviously more bright in color, skinnier bodies, thinner antenna. Uh, moths tend to have a very thick body, very uh, fat. Um, bears love eating uh, moths and cocoons and caterpillars because they they're, have a very high fatty content. So there you go. Um, and their antennas look like ferns. And their antennas actually are uh, pheromone receptors. So that's how they find each other, is that they actually have little receptors so they can smell each other with their antenna. So it's kind of cool. Here's some examples, again, of skippers. There's a silver spotted skipper. Their caterpillars are just really strange looking. So if you ever see a small, maybe inch, um, to maybe two inches, usually they're uh, under an inch. Um, caterpillar that just has like a really predominant head, like you can see the little brown head on this guy, that's probably a skipper caterpillar. Uh, the bottom picture is a blue-tailed uh, skipper, which is one of the prettier ones that we have here in our area in North Carolina. Any questions so far, Debbie, or are we good? We're good. Okay. Okay, so I am not a worm. Okay, so butterflies and moths are actually not worms. Worms are a completely different animal, literally. They are not, worms are not insects at all. So moths and butterflies, actually their caterpillar or their larva actually do have the word worm in them. For example, canker worms, tomato hornworms, inchworms, cutworms, uh, army worms. Those are not worms at all. They're not. They actually have legs. So that tells you right there that they're not a worm. They are a caterpillar. And most of them are larva for moths, believe it or not. So if you see any of these worms, inchworms, tomato hornworms, they are actually the larval stages of a moth. Um, mo and all, every one of those there that I mentioned are in fact moths and not butterflies. Um, butterflies and moths typically, you know, their larvae are called caterpillars and they come in all shapes and sizes. Some are fuzzy, some are prickly, uh, they're spotted, they're, some of them look like snakes. Uh, it, it's just very, very cool at how diverse their larva looks. And they look absolutely nothing like the adults, absolutely nothing. And uh, so when we talk a little bit about metamorphosis, I'll get into uh, somehow, you know, the different stages and not too detail-y. Um, just word of, of warning, if you do bring and decide to do a butterfly garden or rear caterpillars, just remember some furry or spiny caterpillars can actually sting. There are quite a few here that are native to our area, like the saddleback caterpillar um, that will pack a punch. It actually has stinging hairs and will swell and some people can have really severe reactions to them. So when in doubt, do not pick them up. And I, every time I do my classes for kids, you know, kids are always curious. They always want to touch stuff or whatever. But I always tell them, you know, if it's furry or fuzzy, it's spiny, it's telling you something. It's prickly, leave me alone. Okay, so don't pick it up. When in doubt, don't pick it up. Um, pupating is the last step that the larva goes through before they become a butterfly or a moth. So when you, you'll probably see them if, once you start to get, if you're really serious about this and you start to get into it, you'll start to see various stages of, you know, the, um, from the egg to the caterpillar to the pupa or cocoon all the way up to the hatched adult. So you'll start to see and recognize some of the different um, stages that, that they're in in your garden. Okay, so here, holy plants, Batman. If anybody remembers the 1960s, 70s TV show of Batman, you know, Pam, wow, you know, all that. Okay, so yes. Uh, and this is, this is where the uh, butterfly gardening is not for the faint of heart. If you have, and you know that you are a zero tolerance kind of person, that you cannot handle having things looking chewed or spotty or, you know, maybe having aphids on it or, you know, some other kind of insect pests. You have to understand that this is going to go hand in hand with actually preparing an environment 
that is going to foster a healthy ecosystem for not only your butterflies, but for everybody. So you kind of have to embrace everybody. Um, so when you start to see that your plants are getting chewed, it's actually not a bad thing. It's a good thing. That means that you have the right plant in the right place for that an insect or butterfly in this case laid their eggs on and is now that very hungry caterpillar, just like the Eric Carl book, is going to eat it and eat it and eat it and eat it until finally he becomes one day a beautiful caterpillar or a beautiful butterfly. So um, what you'll start to see too is as they eat, and if you have a lot of caterpillars on a particular plant, like I'll use parsley as an example, or anything in the parsley family, uh, carrots, fennel, dill, parsley, um, yes. And you will see a lot of um, butterflies will lay their eggs on those. So you will start to see frass, which is the scientific term for caterpillar poop. You will start to see a lot of it. And uh, so if you're going out to scout, you know, there'll be little black pellets or sometimes if it's a tomato hornworm, it will be a big green pellet. Um, and your plants, plants will look pretty bad. So you just have to understand that that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And ultimately, the caterpillar only does this for a short period of time, sometimes between seven to 10 days. And then eventually they'll stop because they're going to pupate and go in their chrysalis or their cocoon. And your plants are going to bounce back. It's fine. It's going to be fine. It'll be all right. So you just have to understand that. So here's some pictures of some caterpillars. And as I mentioned early, earlier, the one in the upper right hand corner actually does look like a little snake. Um, it has the two big eye spots on it. So it looks like a face, but that's not its eyes. Those are just spots on its back. Its face is down here underneath uh, the bottom. Uh, the caterpillar to the left, I put my hand in the picture there so that you can get a reference as to how big this caterpillar is. Uh, and I believe that was a Luna moth uh, caterpillar that just happened to be crossing my uh, yard at one point. Uh, it was probably about four or, four or five inches long. Um, so they can be caterpillars uh, for butterflies and moths. Remember, the bigger the moth, the bigger the caterpillar. So if you have a very large caterpillar eating your stuff, it's going to wind up being a pretty big moth or a butterfly. Uh, the bottom lower left corner picture is a tomato hornworm um, caterpillar and all the little white ricey things on its back. This guy here did some damage to my particular plant, but a predatory wasp that lives in my garden decided to use him as an incubator. So he laid all his little eggs and uh, those are all his little um, babies on the caterpillar's back. And at this point, you don't want to destroy the caterpillar. You want to leave it alone. It actually is just a zombie at this point. It's like the, the walking dead. It's not eating anymore. It's not doing anything because all of those little larvae that are attached to its back from that predatory wasp are literally sucking the life out of it. And in a few days, you'll see that caterpillar will fall off and be completely desiccated. Like it would have no fluid left in it, it'll just be literally skins. And all of those little ricey things will have holes in them because those larvae will, will have hatched into adults and are flying around. So that's a very good tomato hornworm to have right there if it's looking like that. The interesting one in the lower right, this, this is actually the caterpillar here. I don't know if you can see my pointer. Um, it's the, the branch to the right that goes from the vertical branch to the leaf, that's actually a geometrid, ca geometrid caterpillar. Uh, it was about six inches long. And how I even noticed it, because it blended so well, this river birch was maybe only at the time, maybe two foot tall. And I happened to be walking by it and I was like, wow, it grew a branch, you know, six inches overnight. That's crazy, you know? And I touched it and it was squishy. So I was like, ew, cool, <laughs> ew, cool. So I took a picture of it, obviously dragged my daughter home from off the bus. And uh, I was like, you gotta touch it, you gotta touch it. Anyway, it was very cool. So Any Amy, a, a question? Somebody wants to know what the uh, yellow caterpillar with the eye spots becomes. What's the adult? This is a, I believe a tiger swallowtail. So uh, one of those yellow and black striped uh, tiger swallowtail, big butterfly, very pretty. 
Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so the blurry picture upper left, because I was so excited that I actually got a picture of a Saddleback Caterpillar. Uh, this is one of the ones that actually does pack a punch. This one has stinging hairs. And it's called a Saddleback because it actually looks like it has a blanket with a saddle over its back. Uh, the caterpillar is very good at camouflage because it's that brown and green and they're very prevalent in, during the middle of the summer. So you, you know, they tend to like this guy was underneath a branch. So um, before you're reaching in anywhere, always put eyeballs on where you're going with your hands uh, just to make sure there's no bees, wasps, hornets, or potentially stinging caterpillars. The uh, caterpillar upper right. Uh, this is actually a black swallowtail caterpillar, one of my favorites. Um, I work out on a farm, so I have a caterpillar relocation pro program. So whenever we have caterpillars on things that we need to sell, I usually bring some home with me and feed them at my house so that I can uh, hatch them and release them. Um, he's just very cool. The two little yellow things sticking off the top of his head is actually um, has a liquid on it. And if you touch its back, it rears back and puts these things out. So it's a defense mechanism because usually predators are going to go at it with their mouth. So what it does is he puts this th these two things that look like antenna out with this liquid and it actually touches the predator in the mouth and it's very foul tasting. Not that I've tried it, that's what I've heard, um, but it does smell funny and I like the smell. I think it's sweet. Uh, a lot of people think it's stinky, but I happen to like them. They're my favorite caterpillar. Uh, the bottom left is actually a monarch chrysalis and that was taken out at, uh, taken out at our teaching garden out at the Union County Agricultural Center. Um, we actually have uh, gotten a grant for milkweed and I know that patch of milkweed out there sometimes look really, really bad, but this is the end result is that we are part of a, a, a conservation program for the monarch uh, butterfly. Uh, the chrysalis that's down at the bottom right is actually a, uh, I believe it was a gulf fritillary uh, chrysalis and it looks like it has tiny two rows of tiny silver buttons like a double breasted jacket so it's just very pretty uh, chrysalis. Okay so real quick metamorphosis so what you're going to see mostly if you do uh, decide to do some butterfly gardening is you're going to see most of the caterpillars. You will see some of the adults flying around uh, and if you have host plants, you will see the caterpillars for sure. Um, so their primary goal, because they have such a short lifespan, so when you see a butterfly or a moth, you should really enjoy it. Uh, if you remember that really large moth that I showed, it was actually a caterpillar for much longer than it was an adult. The, Cic the Cecropia moth actually is a caterpillar for about three weeks, but as an adult, it only lives for five days and it doesn't even have a mouth. It doesn't eat. Its sole purpose is to fly around, sense its pheromones for another partner to mate, and then they die. That's it. That's their primary goal as an adult. So they don't do any damage. So when you see a butterfly or a moth, you should embrace it because they're only here for such a very short period of time. Um, Females lay their eggs on host plants and in a few days, the larva or the caterpillar hatches. They usually eat their egg casing first and then they will move on to whatever plant it is. Now mom, as far as butterflies and moths go, actually have feet that have pads that taste. So when a butterfly is flying and landing on things ever so shortly, uh, it's just because they're kind of giving it a taste. Nope. Nope, nope, ooh, yes. And then she will lay her eggs and she will repeatedly go back to that plant to lay her eggs as many times as she can and she will find it. And so I have parsley and dill and fennel all over my garden. I have mine that I cover with netting that I use for culinary purposes, but the rest is for them. So you're gonna have to keep that in mind and we'll talk about that um, in a little bit. Uh, caterpillars eat and grow many, many times in size. They shed their skin along each, each 
journey. So when they first hatch, they don't often look like the final instar, and there's usually four to five stages in between there as they grow. Um, and their final instar is the largest caterpillar. And a lot of times that won't look anything like the one that hatches immediately out of the egg. So if you're going to be serious about rearing them and protecting them, you need to do your homework and learn what they look like at each stage so that you know that you're not going to, you know, be off offensive or potentially get rid of them thinking it might be a pest rather than what you're actually trying to accomplish. Uh, pupation is the last stage and many, many times the caterpillars don't stay on the plant that they were eating. They move and they go pretty quick and they go pretty far um, and they will form their uh, either cocoon. Some most moths will cocoon underground or pupate underground uh, and butterflies uh, will most times make a chrysalis somewhere suspended from some other plant, maybe, you know, across the yard. So during the fall, you should be a little bit more um, aware when you're doing a fall cleanup, say, and cutting things back or what have you. You may actually have uh, chrysalises in there that blend. They look like crinkly leaves or, you know, they do such a good job at hiding themselves because that's when they're the most vulnerable. Any questions so far? No? No. Good. Okay, so the next montage of pictures is actually um, all the pictures that I had taken during the course of uh, one of the first seasons that we had our milkweed out at the teaching garden. So I have two uh, monarch butterflies uh, mating and it's interesting how they just hang, you know, uh, end to end upside down and, and they really just, they, they were there for quite a while, which is why I was able to get such a good picture. Um, the Picture to the right is a female laying an egg on the milkweed. She bends her body down and her ovipositor is all the way at the bottom. And she will flutter and lay an egg certain places along each milkweed. They kind of space them out um, so that this way they give each caterpillar kind of a, a running start um, so that they have enough food. Bottom left, is the largest caterpillar going into their J. They suspend themselves upside down by a tiny little silk thread. And then eventually they will split their skin. And I was, again, the picture's a little blurry because I was so excited that I got that stage on film um, where they actually split that last skin and they start to form what's the harder outer shell of their uh, pupa or their chrysalis. And let me just tell you that from that stage to the final stage, when they emerge as a winged adult, they are going through chemical changes, physical changes. They're literally a bag of goo in there and they're rearranging themselves entirely to come out and then become the winged adult, which is completely different than what they started out as. And it's just amazing to me that they can do this and come out perfect. It's just, how, you know, how do they do that? I, I think that's amazing. Um, bottom picture there, upper left corner of the bottom picture, you can see a chrysalis, a monarch chrysalis that's just ready to hatch. Um, so it becomes clear, it's not that green color anymore, and eventually it will pop open and the winged adult will come out. Okay, Annie, we have a question. Okay. Um, Emily asked, how many eggs can a female lay? It depends on which butterfly or moth. Some will lay a profusion of them anywhere from hundreds. Uh, sometimes some will just do maybe 10, 50, you know, 10 or 50. But most of them are in that 50 to 100 range, you know, depending. Um, their life cycle is so short that a lot of times they have more than one brood throughout a season, figured from frost to frost. So uh, a lot of times, because the generation will only live maybe 30 days tops, so they can pump out three different generations in one spring to summer season from frost to frost. So, you know, they try to get as many eggs as they can in during that time, but it's not as much as, say, other insects like beetles or ticks, for instance, that can lay 6,000 eggs, one female. You know, this, they're not up in those kinds of numbers. Uh, just because simply they're bigger as well. Um, so, you know, they tend to be less. Okay. Does that thank answer you. the question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. 
Okay, so the picture to the left is the winged adult coming out of its chrysalis, me getting to hold it as his wings are pumping up. I'm so proud. I was such a happy mom. And then this was the final uh, monarch generation that was fluttering through uh, the Extension Master Gardener uh, garden. This was probably by the looking at the mums, I would have to say was September, October, somewhere before last frost or first frost, I should say. Okay, so now that all being said, now you have to, once you've gone through this, now do you really love butterflies? Because this is where the key points come in. You yourself have to do some soul searching and understand, do you really love them enough to go forward with planting and drawing them into your garden? Because again, it's not for the faint of heart. You know, what can I do to help protect them while uh, they're in my garden? Uh, from the adult to the egg to the caterpillar, what do I need to do to start drawing them in to my garden? What do I plant? How do I plant it? Where do I plant it? Uh, what's a nectar versus a host plant? Because if you go to a lot of those websites that I had showed earlier, um, you will see that they, they will break down the plants by category. You know, ones for nectar, which is ones that are gonna draw the adults in because they're looking for that food versus a host plant, which you would, if you are planning on having them stay, this is the one that the mom may not necessarily get nectar from all the time, but one that her, she will lay her eggs on so that her caterpillars will have food. Uh, and then creating a habitat that will foster all of these things. And you do need to prepare yourself. And then what are the benefits to doing, to doing all these things? So this is really the soul searching page. You got, you got to really think about, um, you know, if you're, if you're ready and if you're ready, this is what, this is the first step to becoming ready. It's not okay to spray. I'm sorry, folks. You know, man is en enemy number one. It's just, it just is what it is. Uh, loss of habitat clearing, um, you know, taking underbrush out, cleaning up your leaf, leaf litter over the end of, you know, the fall, um, insecticide, herbicides, street lights, uh, front porch lights, uh, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, butterflies, moths, caterpillars, uh, and, and all that, they are insects, as are any beneficials like lady beetles, predatory wasps, honeybees, you know, all those kind of things. Any insecticide that you spray, on your plants or are put down granular on the ground will kill them. They're, it's not discriminatory. Um, insecticides really don't discriminate. So if you choose to use them, make sure you read the directions. You should be doing that anyway, because the label is the law, but use them wisely and understand that if you're trying to get in those beneficials as well as butterflies and moths, that flowers are key. You cannot be spraying your flowers any drift that you may be you doing, you know, say you're doing a spot application, any drift on a windy day like today is gonna, could potentially um, make a, be a hazard to some of the potential pollinators that you may be having to come to, to some flowers. You know, some folks are like, well, I hate the Japanese beetle. How am I gonna get them to stop eating my, um, you know, knockout roses? Well, don't worry about your knockout roses to be completely honest they're going to chew them yeah they bounce back and they look beautiful in the fall then you get a second bloom ding so you gotta just think you know is it's it's going to be okay your plants will bounce back protecting them from predators now i have seen some really interesting things that i have learned and i have to pass this on so food for thought um Here's the picture to the left is my parsley patch that I have for my pet caterpillar relocation program. And what I do is I actually made like a PVC, it was like a plastic hoops. So similar to like a cold frame, but instead of putting plastic over it, I put netting over it so that birds and things can't get in there to, to literally pick off my caterpillars one by one. Um, what I did see, which was interesting, is that squirrels will go in there and they will eat the, the chrysalises and stuff. So I actually had to put them, my, my uh, caterpillars that were ready to go into chrysalis or pupate in something that was more formidable because the squirrels were getting in there and eating them. What? Yes. So I, I had to, this was my old way of protecting them. Now I have the box, which is like a rabbit hutch with screening on it. So I can put them in there and uh, squirrels won't eat them and birds will eat them too. Any questions? Or are we good? Yeah. Uh, uh, is, is 
is deer off bad the the product you know deer repellent called deer off i'm not sure what the active ingredient is in that it may be urine ish <laughs> debbie <laughs> it might be, i don't it might be rotten eggs i'm not sure i don't think so but you know read the label um and if it says that it may be harmful to some insects then yes uh, and if you're going to use it, again, don't spray it on any plants that could potentially be a host plant where the caterpillar will eat the leaves, stems, and things like that. Uh, and especially don't spray it on flowers. Um, and I know deer will, that's what they're going for is the choice stuff, which is the tender new growth and the pretty nice flowers that taste all sweet. Um, but read the directions. I'm not really sure. That's a first question for me. I'll have to research that and find out. The, Annie, the deer off has capsicum, egg solids, and garlic oil in it. So, it shouldn't. Yeah. So It shouldn't. Yeah. Because all of those things target mammalian uh, taste buds. So I think it should be all right. Yeah. But uh, when in doubt, leave it out. There you go. Uh, somebody, uh, Kelly says you're just awesome and positive. Uh, <laughs> And then, uh, Kelly also says the deer off I use is peppermint oils and rosemary. Would that be okay? I think that should be okay too. Again, what they're doing is they're target targeting nose like smell and taste of which most insects don't don't have. Um, mm. But you know, if you if you have a stand of flowers or something that you really want to protect and you're worried about it. I would protect them in a different way from the deer, maybe netting or something like that so that they won't eat it as opposed to spraying the flowers, if that'll help. If it's practical, you know, it may not be practical to do that. Somebody um, else says that the deer off is the most noxious smell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it is. <laughs> I'm sure it is. That's all for now. Okay, so gardening for, for butterflies and moths. So if you're serious about it and you're embracing it and you're, and you're ready to take the next level and you're deciding, okay, it's not okay to spray, I think I can be good with that. Just remember this. If you plant it, they will come. That's simple. Create a habitat in your yard. Uh, butterflies and moths will find the plants they need to survive just so you just put them in the garden. And all of those resources and websites that I had showed uh, you earlier um, will have lists and lists and lists of different things and, and particularly ones that are easy to grow in our, in our area. Most of them are native plants, so they will do well with very little work. So that's a, a plus. Um, you know, providing a variety of nectar plants that bloom from spring until fall will also increase the chances of them coming into your garden. And here's the thing, we've had such a wacky year this year as far as weather. It was so warm early or late winter, and then it got cool, and now it's getting really hot again, <coughs> excuse me, that Butterflies were flying around in like early or early March, late February, and then they took a break because it got cooler and it got very wet. And now they're just starting to show back up again. So don't be discouraged because a lot of times weather will affect them. Um, I didn't mention when they were going through their metamorphosis process, temperature is a trigger. So night temperatures and even day temperatures have to be at a certain temperature for them to trigger the now I'm going to come out as a winged adult. And I think it's 50 or 55 consistently. Um, if they roost overnight, that they wait for the sunlight to heat their bodies and get their wings pumping again, literally their blood pumping into their wings so that they can fly. So you won't see a lot of butterflies flying around in the early cool mornings. You'll see them more towards the heat of the day, like the end of the day. Um, and then providing a long bloom time, and it doesn't have to be one plant that's your workhorse, intermix different plants that will have different bloom times. So you want things that will bloom early, say even before first frost in case we do have a warm um, you know, winter like we did this year so that you can get those early stragglers that may be hatching. Or, and you want ones that will last well into fall so that the last generations, like in the case of the monarch, will have enough food sources to get them ready for their long migration back to where they're going in Mexico or if you're out on the West Coast in California. So, you know, that's something to keep in mind as well. 
Here's some examples of nectar plants. Uh, I kind of talked about this really uh, versus host plants. And that's just the specifics of each type of category. Um, now, some species of butterflies and moths, I didn't mention this part though, are very particular about what host plant they have. Some of them are not. Um, and a lot of those resources that I posted earlier will tell you by butterfly or moth what their preferred host plants are. And there are some like the monarch that only likes milkweed, period. It will not lay its legs on anything else. So if you're looking to embrace the monarch, you have to embrace a very weedy, uh, messy, potentially um, aggressive host plant. So just, you know, do your homework before you start planting some of these things. So Annie, a question related to that. Uh, it's the person says my milkweed is in massive bloom, but no butterflies. Is that because they're, they only come there to lay their eggs? No. Um, you, you, have you seen, if she hasn't seen any butterflies, I've seen a very scant few. Um, I actually did have one butterfly, one monarch come through my yard just the other day and I haven't seen it since. Um, because we haven't been able to go out to the Ag Center, I'm not sure if there's a population that has showed up out there either. Um, but don't be discouraged. It's early. We've had a very, very wet, cool few weeks here. So just give them time and they should show up. Um, and that milkweed has a very long bloom time, so they may still be blooming by the time um, monarchs, but other butterflies will visit them uh, as well. So, and sp especially skippers, they like them too. Okay. Um, Emily says that her daughter Amelia is watching with her. She's 10 and has been rearing butterflies and moths for several years in a huge net. She has several collections that she has saved. And we were told that there's something we can put in the boxes to prevent the collections from deteriorating. What do you recommend? There's, there's a, a preservative that if, if you actually look it up, and I don't remember the chemical name, I actually just use um, uncooked rice as a desiccant because moisture is really your biggest problem. Um, if you want to do it professionally and pin them and things like that, um, then I would follow pretty closely with what they recommend because then those specimens will last the longest. My specimens, I don't pin, I just have them in their natural form because I find them um, and I don't kill them, I, for lack of a better way of explaining it, just for show. I, my collection can, it consists of only ones that I found at the end of their life cycle. Um, so I haven't killed any in the name of science. Um, but, you know, if you do want to professionally do it, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, because I had one as a kid, um, but I didn't do any, any of that. But there are directions and uh, specific ch chemicals that you can use, and I'm just drawing a blank on what it is at the moment. But the quick fix would be to put desiccated, uh, uncooked rice in there as a desiccant because it will absorb a lot of the moisture. Some of my specimens I've had in jars now, seal jar with rice, upwards of six or seven years. So they do last a long time. Okay, so plants that you might choose, unless there's another question. We good? Oh yes, there is one more question. Okay. Just popped up. Patricia says, my milkweed often gets prone to aphids, she thinks. Is that a deterrent to the butterflies laying eggs? Not that I've seen. Not at all. Um, the ones that we have have out at the Ag Center get covered in aphids every year. They also get milkweed beetles that chew them and suck the juices out of them, and the monarchs find them, and they lay their eggs, and they do just fine. They'll be fine. The thing is, is you may want to have a quantity. Now we started out with 50 plants. We, they probably multiplied into 150 plants by now over the last three years. But uh, you know, you want to give them a choice. You want to give them more than one plant. So if you have the space and you know to let it run and have the milkweed um, expand and take over, then that's all the better. The more the merrier. So hopefully that will help. Okay, so plants to choose, you know, plant what you like, you know, obviously you're going to want your garden to be pretty so that it's enjoyable to you. 
Uh, all the same rules apply, you know, if you want to plant a butterfly garden, so you do your homework, you find the list of the plants that you might want to have as nectar or host. And then just remember, all the same rules apply. You know, you want to look at the hardiness zones, you want to see what their water needs are, and you want to put them in the right place. Because if your plant's struggling, any onslaught of uh, caterpillars on it may potentially kill it. Uh, I know most of them, if they're healthy, will bounce back. Uh, but if your plant's struggling, you don't want to um, introduce it to, you know, an onslaught of caterpillars. So you just want to make sure that you do your homework on which plants you pick. Old-fashioned and native plants are fla uh, flowers are the best choices. Uh, most of these uh, species of butterflies, moths, and skippers kind of adapted in nature to each other. So a lot of times, um, when if you get like echinacea or purple cone flower, for example, they have a lot of cultivars now and hybrids where they're white, they're pink, they're double, they're pincushion, they're green, they're orange. But, you know, be leery of those fancy ones because sometimes they may be sterile, so they may not have nectaries, they may not produce nectar. Uh, the other look pretty, but you'll notice that butterflies won't visit them. I had a pincushion version and nobody, not even bees visited it until I did my homework and I was like, duh, it's sterile and it doesn't, it's not producing any nectar. It looked pretty, but I dug it out, gave it to somebody. Um, butterflies are attack, attracted to certain colors. Now they don't see the same spectrum of light that we do. Uh, so butterflies and moths see a completely different uh, spectrum. So their favorites tend to be purple and yellow, although they see them as a completely different color, uh, followed by white, then blue and red, although that order really doesn't matter. They're not picky. If there's enough nectar, um, they're good. Flower size, uh, bigger is not always better. It all depends on the size of their proboscis. So if you have a very small moth, it doesn't, it's not going to want a very huge flower. It may visit it, but it will tend to go to ones that are smaller, multi-flowered, like a lantana, say, that has groupings of smaller flowers, lace flowers. Um, a lot of like the Baptisia, indigo, false indigo, things that bloom and have snapdragons, you know, very different flowers sometimes are adapted to particular pollinators, specifically bees, not so much to butterflies. But if you have a larger butterfly, they will prefer larger flowers. So it's good to have a mix. So keep that, you know, in the back of your mind too when you're planning um, a garden. Here's some examples of some of the uh, nectar and host plants that I've used, other ones that are recommended, you know, for particular butterfly and moth species, uh, butterfly bushes, verbena, anything that has small um, multi flowers are usually the most popular. A lot of times hummingbirds and things will visit these very same flowers as well and bees. Uh, loud, large flowers, uh, zinnias, echinacea, rudbeckia, some of these are annuals, some of them are perennials, so you can mix, mix them in. You don't have to have all annual or all perennial, but just remember this. Annuals tend to have usually more nectar because annual flowers have just one season to flower, seed, and die where perennials may not make as much, as much nectar because they have a very long bloom time, they die back and then they come up again in the spring. So you may want to do a mix of both to give your butterflies a really good buffet, okay? Annie, yeah. question. Uh, can you attract butterflies and moths in shade? Yes. There are a lot of shade plants that you can do. In fact, a lot of the butterflies, like the pipe vine swallowtail, uh, tiger swallowtail, um, luna moths, things like that, they actually don't necessarily care for uh, flowers. Their hosts are trees, bushes. Mm -hmm shrubs. So, you know, if you have, like, I have a stand of sassafras trees in my backyard, so I get a lot of pipeline swallowtail uh, caterpillars and butterflies visiting just because I have a stand of host plants in the back that they found. So it may not necessarily be, um, you know, the nectar or the flower that draws them in. You may want to, they may be more prone to return if you have a food source. 
So the list of host plants here on the right, that's just a quick list. Trust me, there's hundreds and hundreds, uh, depending on which butterfly that you're looking to bring into your yard. Um, and again, you know, don't think you're going to see something super califragilistic, expialidocious, you know, that's native to South America. That's not going to happen. You're going to have to cater to the ones that are indigenous to our area. Um, you know, I, I just said that, you know, you're not going to see a blue morpho butterfly that's, you know, uh, native to Ecuador and South, Central America. You're not going to see it here. So, you know, don't hold out hope, although we do have some pretty blue butterflies here. We have the red spotted purple, um, which is actually blue. Uh, so if you're serious about embracing butterflies, you know, again, do your homework. I cannot stress that enough. You know, look up lists of plants and, and of host plants and nectar plants. Having a good smattering of both really works the best, I found. Um, the internet is a great resource. I like books. Wait, look, I have all kinds of really good books. This one here is about your pest moths and other insects in the garden. This one is good. It's a quick, I like field guides, um, has some good pictures, but they're drawings. Now you get to the good books, the really good books that have photographs. Yeah, that's what you want. So what you actually want to do is field guides that have photographs. And I'm trying to get my hands on the Swift Guide to Butterfly because they actually have thick pictures of the caterpillars. Because remember, when I talked earlier, you're mostly going to see the caterpillar stage because the butterflies can fly great distances. Uh, and they may not necessarily stay in your yard. They'll just visit. So you're going to want to know what the eggs and what the, the different stages of the caterpillar look like, or at least the mature version of the caterpillar. And there's a lot of good um, websites that you can look them up if you can't find it in a really good book. But I like having the book because I have it with me. And a lot of times I'm somewhere where I don't have internet service, even with my phone. So I just rather do that. Uh, visit public gardens and butterfly houses for ideas. You know, they usually have a lot of non-native species of butterflies, which are ones that will feed in the little sponges that they have with all the fruity stuff. Yeah, we're not going to have those here. But, you know, you can get an idea of how they set it up um, with, you know, the smattering of different flower sizes, maybe, you know, what vines, you know, that kind of stuff, just to get some ideas. Um, this was an interesting statistic when, when I went to certify my backyard as a certified natural uh, habitat. Um, a study of backyard habitats in Florida showed that the, the certified habitats do indeed have what's right for wildlife. Compared with non-certified yards, these properties have many more places for wildlife to raise young. And this means everything, not just butterflies and caterpillars but a whopping 90% of those habitat owners grow host plants for caterpillars compared to only 8% of the neighbors and only 4% of owners at random. So incorporating a certified backyard habitat kind of it umbrellas everybody. So if you're already doing a wildlife habitat in your backyard, you're probably more than three quarters of the way already there. Um, you just may need to add some, maybe some um, host, more host plants or additional nectar plants and things like that. Remember, bird baths are always welcome. Poopy mud puddles. I know that sounds gross, but here's a list of some of the things that you might need to consider when you're creating a, hab a habitat. Provide shelter. Um, some of them will over overwinter in brush piles, uh, or they'll have a butter you know butterfly boxes. Although everyone I've talked to have said butterfly boxes are pretty, but they really are not where butterflies tend to roost. They tend to decide nature is better, and then a box. Um, have water, you know, a, a bird bath that's very shallow. Uh, I used for a long time before I got a really pretty one, an upside down Frisbee because it was shallow and I threw it in the, on the ground. Uh, I was able to bury it in and I put sand in it and uh, the butterflies actually like that uh, because it was just moist sand and not just standing water. Um, overripe fruit will work. Uh, highly recommend putting that on uh, bird feeder stations that are baffled so that you, because you will draw in other critters 
for the for the overripe fruit. Um, leaf litter on the ground. Uh, a lot of moths and things will overwinter in leaf litter on the ground. I have a wooded area that's probably about half my property that I don't rake, I don't blow, I don't do anything. I leave all the leaves there um, just to provide a habitat for other critters. Uh, and yes, your host plants will get eaten, so just accept it. You're just gonna have you're just gonna have to accept it especially your herbs, things that you might really, really like to eat yourself. So plant some for you, plant some for them. I have mine are on opposite ends of my yard. And like I said, I put bird netting over the stuff that I cut and use to cook with um, because most butterflies and moths are too big to get through the holes. So it'll keep them from getting to them to lay their eggs on it. So that's why I protect mine and I leave the others open for them to get to it. And that works well for your tomatoes as well. Uh, the sphinx moth, again, bigger caterpillar means a bigger moth. They're so big, they can't get through bird netting. So if it's practical for you, if your uh, tomatoes are trellised or caged, just throw bird netting over it and that will keep the, um, the sphinx moth from laying its eggs on your tomatoes, but it, the holes are big enough for bees and things to still get through to pollinate your flowers, so you'll still get fruit. Um, because of the things that I listed here, you know, you will invite other critters too. So if you do the overripe fruit, if you do the poopy mud puddle, you'll get raccoon, possum, snakes. So you do really have to decide how far you're gonna go. Um, I did do the overripe fruit for a while, except that I was just feeding the raccoon and possum and I decided it wasn't worth it. So I just don't do it anymore. Um, they, or I actually do, orange slices sometimes up on my bird feeding station in a suet cage, you know, those little black or those little boxy uh, suet snapshot cages. I'll put them in there so that the critters are, it's high enough, squirrels and them can't get to it, but the butterflies can. Any questions? No. no? Good. Okay, so what's in it for me? So now that you've gone all through all this, you have to be selfish, right? So what's in this for me? One, you get beautiful flowers because now you're incorporating more flowers into your yard, whether they be host or nectar plants. You get the, the joy of seeing beautiful butterflies and skippers. You will have more beautiful fruit and vegetables because now you're bringing in a whole nother category of pollinators. That pumpkin down there is my personal pumpkin that I grew and I was very proud of it. So that made the cut in the pictures. And you'll have a very well balanced garden because now you're incorporating things that like that statistic said about the wildlife habitats in Florida. If you do this, you're also gonna be fostering a whole other set of um, critters in the ecosystem, you know, by not spraying, by turning off the porch light at night, you know, maybe setting a timer for any lights that you may need to have out. Uh, moths are drawn to light. It's a fact. Bats fly into my windows all the time. So, uh, you know, I make sure that I turn the lights off at night. And just so that, you know, um, they have a, a good place to live too. Uh, and then, you know, what more do you want? I think that's a great set of things, you know, you can go out in your garden and enjoy it. You know, as long as you can get over the um, onslaught of the eating part, you'll be fine. So here's some pictures of some other um, guys, the, the pollinators that I have uh, experienced in my backyard or out at the teaching garden. Um, you'll see hummingbird moths. They fly during the day. They're one of the few moths that actually do fly during the day. And they look like a bumblebee, but they're not. The little guy next to him on the upper left-hand corner, the this guy right here, he's a fiery skipper, isn't he cute? He's kind of very tiny. He's only like three quarters of an inch, maybe an inch, and he's all fuzzy and blonde. He almost looks like a golden retriever. He's got these huge, big, fat face eyes. Ooh, fuzzy. Okay, a buckeye, common buckeye, you will see him in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, the tiger swallowtail, that was that caterpillar that looked like the snake that uh, I showed earlier, but this is what the butterfly looks like, bottom left-hand corner. And the black swallowtail uh, or butterfly um, is uh, there on a budlia. That's actually a butterfly bush. Um, there's been some bad 
raps given to butterfly bushes lately about them being um, invasive, et cetera, uh, and also certain milkweeds not being good for certain butterflies. Most of that information doesn't apply to our area, but it is always good to check to see if some of these host plants are on the USDA invasive list for North Carolina. You should check that because you don't want to plant some of that stuff uh, in your yard for those for other reasons and other environmental reasons. But unless anybody has any questions, that's all I have. Okay, you got a, couple, a comment, a couple of questions. Uh, uh, Pam Morgan says, but I always get yellow jackets when I put out fruit. <laughs> I know, I stopped too. Um, and that, you know, eventually even the cages, you're right, you do bring in a lot more bees and you know, regular bees are fine, but yeah, the yellow jackets, they're just nasty. They're kind of mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Patricia says, every year I have caterpillars on my deal, but I never see butterflies. In fact, one day the caterpillars are on the plant and the next morning, every single one is gone. Is that part of the process? Yes, somebody's eating them. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's probably birds that are eating them because I had that too. It was like, you know, the, the legend of Roanoke. One day I had a healthy village there and then the next day they were all gone and I had just nothing, like zero evidence. Um, I staked it out. And so I actually watched it was birds picking them off. Um, so that's why I decided I was going to cover um, the parsley and the dill once the caterpillars were actually on it because they're not visible until they get much larger. And that's when the birds swoop in and scoop them up. Good to know. Good to know. Uh, love this. Thank you so much. Learned a lot. Just saw a buckeye today. That's from Linda. Thank you very much. This was amazing. Thank you so much. So uh, any other questions out there, type them in the chat box. Or you can email me. I typed my email earlier. Annie, will we be able to share your PowerPoint with ones in the group? Probably. And here I'll put the screen back up again with the resource list. Um, we might be able to, I think. Okay. If you send it to me, I can convert it to a PDF and I can send it out that I way. I sent it earlier. I just didn't think you saw it. Um, okay. I forgot to no, send I it out I this didn't. morning. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, this resource list, there's a couple of other ones that um, notables that I didn't mention earlier. The, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the Forestry Service, the U.S. Forestry Service, actually ha is a great resource um, that they have a lot of lists of other places to go um, even though it's a national, you know, for all of the United States, they will have, you can choose, I believe, by state, uh, and it'll send you down, it's almost a rabbit hole. I could get lost in there for days at looking at some of the sites, but some of these are the ones that are like one-stop shopping. Um, the first one up there, and it rated in order of preference by me, um, the NCSU uh, Going Native uh, publication is actually probably one of the best concise uh, list of plants, hosts, by butterfly, by moth, and, uh, and that's specific to North Carolina. Um, Xerces, NABA, butterfly, uh, the Carolina Butterfly Society is a really good one if you're looking for identification uh, to get information. Uh, some of the others like Xerces and NABA are a little bit more scientific, more heady. Uh, so if you're looking for something that's maybe kid more kid friendly and things like that, you might want to go to pollinator.org. Uh, they have a lot of great uh, resource lists and coloring pages and games and uh, events and all kinds of things that are a lot a lot more of it is geared towards kids. So if you if you have uh, maybe a homeschool project or a STEM project you're looking to do, um, I would recommend starting with uh, pollinator.org. But so it's fun. I hope. Can I ask a question to the group? Did everybody learn something here today? And if you did, then my job here is done. I'm I glad. did. So you can use the reaction. You can do a thumbs up for Annie. And Annie, if you go to gallery view, you should be able to see that. Okay, let's see. 
So Sherry, give her a thumbs up. Use select reactions down at the bottom. There you go. So do I have to stop share to get to that um, menu? Uh, probably, but that's okay. Uh, Y'all can type it into the chat chat box if you want to, and I'll col I'll be co collecting that. Yes, yes, yes. So Annie, a couple uh, more oh, questions. Can you see it? Yes, I got it. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Yes, good job. Uh, let's see, many thanks. Our best NC Cooperative Extension booklet, Butterflies in Your Backyard. Yes. Uh, that's available online. Yes. Uh, lots of focus on host, nursery, and native plants. And then Emily uh, says, we're in Anson County. Are there any butterfly houses within, within 50 miles of Anson slash Union County? Do you know? I don't know the answer to that one, Annie. I'm going to say probably not because the closest ones that I know to us here would be uh, Daniel Stowe has got one. Um, the zoos do. So that would be Columbia or Greensboro um, or Asheboro. Sorry. Um, I Theirs was under construction. So I, a while back, I don't know if it's done and reopened, but um, those would be the closest major ones that I know of. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, somebody asked, thanks very much, great information. Uh, I watched a wasp come and sting some swallowtails cata swaddle swallowtail caterpillars. No. Yeah, that might be a predatory wasp as well, as well, because they don't just target, you know, the tomato hornworm, they will target other caterpillars as well. And, uh, you know, when, when you do the certified habitat, you know, all your insects are basically being protected. So hopefully you'll get a good balance of predator and, you know, prey, um, because butterflies are actually more prey um the, to birds and, and other insects so you kind of have to accept you know there's going to be a certain percentage of of loss <laughs> putting it nicely <laughs> any more questions i uh, uh, entered the uh, uh nc state extension gardener plant toolbox website in the chat box uh, that's a great uh, tool for you to use. You can go in and develop a plant list that fits your garden. So if you want to attract pollinators or you have shade or it's wet or it's dry, you can, you can select all of those things and it will generate a plant list for you. Yeah, uh, so like it's a, go for, ahead, Amy. For, for shade, I know there was a question about that earlier. Um, flowering shade plants are always good to have a still bee. Um, that can tolerate a lot of shade. Hostas can tolerate, and they, most of them have fragrant flowers, so you get to enjoy them as well. Um, if you don't have, if you have deciduous trees, just remember that that's not shaded all year round. You know, there are plants that you can put out there, like springtime ephemerals, that will bloom before the trees leaf out. So you can put bulbs out there, uh, you know, your trilliums, your jack in the pulpits, your, uh, I have tons of daffodils out in my woods that are all blooming before the trees leaf out. So you can still have some color and some nectar um, offerings out in a shaded area that may not be shaded all year round. But you might want to fill that in with the perennials that I mentioned, like columbine, a still be, um, you know, hostas. Uh, I'm trying to think there's, uh, what's the one that we have along the path that the green and gold, um, that's a shade tolerant. You know, there's lots of shade tolerant shrubs that bloom, you know, your camellias and things like that. Um, you know, and there's a lot of full sun natives that can tolerate a good bit of shade they just may not bloom as much um, but there's always you can always play that game and see how far you can push the envelope with with sun and shade <laughs> great job annie thank you so much thanks everybody for joining us uh we are taking a break uh, in july so we'll be back in august and so the august um 
successful gardener is fall lawn care and I'm I'll be the speaker for that one uh, so you know if you want to know what to do with your lawn in the fall uh, join us in August and I'm it's that first Thursday in August I don't have the a calendar in front of me let's see it would be August the 6th is it August the 6th yes yeah and I'm sure you're gonna be talking about cut worms and army worms and all those worms that are not worms right <laughs> probably so <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, thank you all for joining us. We appreciate you joining us and, and hope that you'll join us in the future. Um, if you, you, my email's there. So if you think of a question afterwards and want to send that to me, I can pass it along to Annie and, and pass the, um, have her reply directly or I can reply to you. Yes. Um, so thank you, Annie. Awesome job. You might get, you, you share your passion with us and you're so excited about it and your knowledge and we just i appreciate it it was an awesome presentation thank you you're welcome i it helps to be a geekoid <laughs> just like you know eh. yes <laughs> well we we appreciate it and thank you and good night everybody thank you for joining us good night Bye.